Hello everybody, this is Dr. Cole. It's Sunday afternoon, January 15th, and we're now entering week two of Political Science 1013 on the first uh, eight-week schedule for the spring 2023 term. Okay, everybody, we have several things coming up. Uh, this morning, Sunday, was the first of a, first day of a three-day period we're setting aside for discussion number one. You were assigned an article to read about young voters in the recent midterm election and uh, uh, see what you think of that. Uh, remember, your assignment is to post twice by the end of the discussion period. That will be midnight Tuesday. Post initially and then respond substantively to at least one of your classmates so that you'll have two posts by the end of the discussion period Tuesday. So you have today, Monday, and Tuesday to get that in. Everyone, I sent a message out about this this morning. Uh, there's some news in that announcement about the gentleman who wrote the article that uh, you were assigned to read. So uh, take a look at that for what it's worth. I felt obligated to pass that on. <coughs> um, everyone, our exam is Saturday, Saturday the 21st, our first of four exams. This will be over units one and two. Okay, we talked about unit one last week. I wanted to say a word before we stopped today, today about unit two and about the four articles you have been assigned uh, to read for the exam. Uh, unit one was over participation. Unit two involves political parties and pressure groups. Okay, so let me say just a word about political parties and pressure groups and what we're trying to achieve in that set of notes. We try, to, we try to lay out what political parties are and what they do. Uh, really, political parties there are, are there to facilitate our participation in the system. They are organizations who are formed for the purpose of winning control of the government, by and large, by running candidates for office. Okay? Um, we talk a little bit about the organization of the parties. Political scientists say there are three aspects to the party. There are those of us out in the public who would identify with one party or the other. There are the people who run for and hold office as candidates of one party or the other. And then there's the party organization itself, the Republican and Democratic National Committees and the corresponding organizations that work at the state and local level. Okay? Now... <clears throat> An interesting, important question is why there are only two major parties in America. Okay? We try to discuss that in terms of the rules of the game having been set up to advantage the two biggest parties and to place obstacles in the way of any additional parties who might come along. So look at that closely, if you could, please. Then we try to go through the history of the Republican and Democratic parties, going back to the World War II period and the time of President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his New Deal, at which time the parties took on many of the characteristics they share today. Now, the parties have been through many ups and downs in the meantime, because from that time to the present day is almost a century. There have been shifts from time to time in which of the two parties is on top, which has the advantage, and in the kinds of people who support the two parties. Okay? And there have been some important developing developments that have taken place in that connection over the course of your and my lifetimes. Okay, so we try to go back to the 1930s and then bring you up to date on where the political parties stand today and the twists and turns that they have taken. All right, now, then there are interest groups or pressure groups, whereas there are only two major political parties, there are perhaps many thousands of pressure groups. Uh, there is probably a pressure group organized on behalf of every profession, every occupation, every product or service provided in our economy. Very often, they are out to pursue the economic interests of their members, perhaps not in absolutely every case. There are some groups that claim to be public interest groups, but very often, interest groups are formed to pursue the economic interests of their members. Perhaps not in every case, but that probably accounts for most 
interest groups or pressure groups. We try to go through different sectors of the pressure group system and to identify the major groups in each of those sectors. Uh, they include again, many different sectors of the economy, organized labor, the ag sector, the professional sector, the business sector, technology sector. Governments lobby each other. Okay? Government lobbies itself. State and local governments lobby the federal government. Then there are organizations that purport to speak for the public interest. Now, pressure groups or interest groups are also known as lobbies. The term lobby or lobby, well, the term lobbying is still heard, but lobby as a name for the organization fell out of favor because they do engage in other activities to try to influence the government and further the interests of their members. Uh, they raise money and contribute that to candidates that they think will be helpful to their cause. That often means giving money to incumbents uh, in Congress who have shown a record of being quite likely to get reelected. They will engage in advertising directed at you, the public, trying to get to you, you to respond to create the impression that there is grassroots support for the pressure group's cause or the issues that the pressure group supports. Then there is lobbying itself or direct contact with government officials. We think of a lobbyist approaching a member of Congress. Now, it's often regarded as a corrupt activity, and sometimes it is, but professional lobbyists would tell you that the heart of it is to pro try to provide accurate information to the legislator, uh, which the legislator then perhaps will utilize to make his or her case for supporting the priorities of that particular pressure group. So we have both parties and pressure groups. There are only two major parties. Their aim is to try to elect candidates and win control of the government. Okay. Pressure groups do not do that, but they have other ways of pursuing the interests of their members by, shall we say, working behind the scenes. All right, so you have the class notes for Unit 1 and 2 that will be covered on the exam on Saturday. Now, in addition to that, there are four articles to read. These are separate and distinct from the article we assigned you for our discussion. You have an article from the Atlantic Monthly by Mr. Applebaum about why Americans don't practice democracy anymore. Watch that article carefully as to what he says about what the public schools could do about that. We have an article reported by the Associated Press from Wisconsin about uh, right of center conservative Republican voters in that part of Wisconsin who are, are alarmed and afraid about what's going on in the country and perhaps in some cases may have gone to political extremes. You may know people like this, although I should point out this area of Wisconsin is in the outskirts of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's right across the river that forms the boundary between Minnesota and Wisconsin. So perhaps not quite as thinly populated an area as that around the Oklahoma Panhandle. And you may wish to look at that and compare and contrast the views you see expressed there to those you may have heard about among the people that you know. And we have two articles, one uh, by, I believe it's uh, Ezra Klein, and the other, the name escapes me for the moment, uh, We'll check that in just a moment while we're sitting here. All right, Mr. Brownstein, I'm sorry about that. Mr. Brownstein, and they both, both of those articles discuss the outcome of the recent midterm elections that are about 60 days ago now. The Brownstein article was written immediately after Election Day, within a day or two. The article by Ezra Klein uh, is after, comes after about a, a week after the elections. And it takes a little more of an intermediate to long-term view. Okay. The Brownstein article was written in the immediate aftermath of the election. And they both try to discuss the implications of the election and what it shows us about the American electorate at this time. All right. Now, for the exam, expect 10 or 15 multiple choice items and the rest are true false. About 10 or 15 of the two false items will be based on those four articles that you were assigned to read. Everything else largely based on the class notes for units one and two. You can take the exam anytime Saturday the 21st. You'll have 45 minutes to take the exam once you start.
That's coming up this Saturday the 21st. And after that, we'll be moving on to some more material about which I'll talk to you about next time, one week from today, because uh, a week from now will be just after that exam period for 24 hours on Saturday the 21st. So if you have any difficulties with the exam, please contact me. Uh, I hope everyone will try to post twice to the discussion between now and midnight Tuesday. And once the exam is over Saturday, we'll be talking to you again a week from now, Sunday the 22nd or so, about some new material that we'll be covering for exam two, the midterm exam. So take part in the discussion, study hard for the exam, take it easy. We'll talk to you once again a week from now at this time.